Hi everyone, I'm Bernadette Bullocan. I'm Mark Hedda. And welcome to 16416. Mark and I are going to take a few minutes of your day to talk about some of the best tips that we've seen from thousands of corporate legal departments that we've worked with. And we've identified 16 tips to help your department enter 2016. Mark, tell us about some of the topics we might talk about. Well, the two things that we'll be looking at is uh, the role of the LDO and uh, his or her uh, management of outside counsel, and then also how law departments are staffing down or staffing internally to bring more efficiency and effectiveness to their, the service that they provide to their internal clients. In addition to those topics, in a second part of a webinar, we'll also uh, talk about some of the regulatory and compliance issues that corporate legal departments are facing. And then finally, the final topic we'll discuss are some soft skills that all corporate counsel should exercise, those communication skills, mm -hmm. um, emotional intelligence that corporate counsel need, that are universal and timeless, not just for 2016. So we hope you'll join us for 2016, 16 for 16. And so we're going to take a look at two, uh, two high-level trends. First, we're going to take a look at building stronger internal teams. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means, this focus on the internal team. And then uh, to round out today's webinar, we'll talk about the rise of legal department operations um, and one of their main components and responsibilities, which is improved management and outside counsel. So thanks for joining, Mark. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Mark, let's uh, jump into uh, our first tip and trend for 2016. And that's uh, this trend of hiring for um, hiring and building stronger and larger internal legal teams. Um, any thoughts about why we, we see this trend? Well, I think, you know, what we hear a lot from clients and what our surveys indicate is hiring folks on the inside allow them to better understand their business, the people, the product lines, industries, and it's building that expertise from the inside out. The other thing that it does is it facilitates building stronger relationships with internal clients, which we all know is a, is a huge need for law departments and GCs. Yeah, I think what's happened in the past few years, especially after the global financial crisis is there was such great emphasis on outside counsel and how to better relationship, better the relationships with outside counsel. And I'm really excited to see that departments are growing and they're really focused um, on, on building those relationships with their internal clients, building those stronger understanding of product lines or risk tolerances. And um, it's not just a cost factor, as it is with outside counsel. It's the efficiency of really knowing the business. Yeah, and I think a lot of departments are getting smarter about where they need to hire for expertise and where they need to be able, be able to build expertise from the inside out. And I, I think that's why we see this trend and, yeah. and this focus. Well, if you look, uh, again, Thomson Reuters recently did a survey regarding in-house efficiency uh, for corporate legal departments. And uh, they, uh, the survey demonstrated that not only are legal departments growing, but it's in particular areas. So when you see that there's a several new positions for contracts and compliance, you can see where that business savvy really helps mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. knowing, um, knowing risk tolerances and knowing the people and processes within the business really allow them to hit the ground running. Yep, that makes tons of sense. Um, going on to our second trend this year is again, so not only are they hiring uh, larger corporate legal departments, hiring both lawyers and staff, they're ensuring that all of those new team members hit the ground running. So the Thomson Reuters in-house efficiency survey asked the question, what are you doing to help those new team members on board? And uh, not surprisingly, we saw CLEs come to the top. Uh, what else did we see, Mark? Well, there's, there's also a focus outside of that kind of, let's call it formal training mechanism is, how they stay abreast of trends and just read articles and blogs. And, and as you note here, even separately, how they utilize checklists, which is an interesting, um, an interesting area, I think. Yeah, we see other professionals. You, like I have heard about how doctors are using checklists in surgery just to make sure that they have covered all of, all of the things that need to cover. We're handling so many things. And so a nice checklist to, to literally and figuratively check the box 
um, absolutely help. And of course, what you want to do is you want to rely on articles and blogs and checklists that are from trusted advisors um, and to make sure that they are shared across the entire legal department. What we also see are departments creating you know, playbooks, aggregating all of this know-how. Um, so again, it's not just new members that can hit the ground running, it's the entire legal team that can be the beneficiaries of this playbook um, and to help capture all of the, the institutional knowledge and best practices. Yeah, and I think the last thing that I'd say is, and, and we both practice, so I think we know this firsthand, is it recognizes the challenge of staying abreast of what's happening in a lot of evolving and very emerging industries. And the other bit is, is it implicitly recognizes, particularly with the checklists, how bringing efficiency is really, really important. We're all asked to do more with less, yeah. and the checklists keep us honest and keep efficiency at the forefront of our minds. Absolutely. So we're going to go on to this third uh, trend that we're seeing. And it's, I say it's kind of a funny trend because the reason why we all left the uh, private practice of law and went in-house is one of the reasons, at least, is so we didn't have to track our lives in six-minute increments. Mm -hmm. But one of the trends we do see um, picking up in this past year, and which I think we'll see more in 2016, is um, internal time tracking for corporate legal departments. Um, and then the use of internal surveys. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aggregate these two trends and say that the trend is one towards know thyself and know thy legal department. Now, Mark, you've talked to a few legal departments that are doing these internal time tracking studies. What have you learned from them? Well, you know, I think it's like what we were just talking about around bringing efficiency. I think law departments are, are focused on their staffing models and what their folks are working on and they, they need that insight day to day on what the lawyers in the law department are doing. And while there can be somewhat of a black box, these metrics and these time tracking uh, initiatives allow you to kind of get inside that black box and really determine what's keeping people's time and better ways to prioritize. And as we talk about as business people, focus on their blue chips, the highest priority things that are, that are consuming time and energy in what is a finite pool of resources. Yeah. You know, I think on those internal time tracking studies, they're looking at um, what business units are being served and um, hope, try to identify trends about who in the business is consuming that business, uh, that consuming time, if you will. The other piece that they're tracking is what type of activities. Is it drafting? Is mm -hmm. it uh, you're stuck in meetings all of the time? Is it that you're spending an inordinate amount of time doing administrative tasks? Mm -hmm. And once they have all of that information, they can uh, better direct resources. Maybe additional administrative help is necessary. Or maybe there's a technology that we can purchase that could help allay some of the administrative work. And again, just as you've described, let the lawyers focus on those blue chips, building those relationships with um, internal clients, being proactive rather than reactive. So again, these time studies are limited. They're um, just enough to get enough data mm -hmm. to, um, to create some action around it. So it's not a, it's not a forever type of activity, no, I thank think goodness. The, yeah, I think the folks we've talked to, it may be one, two months in length. Um, but the one best practice that I've heard is it, it happens kind of department-wide, from timekeepers mm -hmm. all the way down to you know support professionals. Everyone tracks their time for a set period of time, and it gives a sense, a holistic view of the law department and how it's spending its time across business units, products, yeah. so on and so forth. Um, the, other, uh, the other trend that we see in Know Thy, this trend of Know Thyself, another best practice we see is the use of the internal survey. So in the last few years, we've seen a great deal of emphasis on evaluating your outside counsel. And one of the trends that we see now are corporate legal departments sending surveys out to their internal business clients. So there's this, you know, there's this stereotype of the corporate legal department as the department of no or the department mm -hmm. of slow down. And things like these internal surveys help flesh out what is driving that. Is it a lack of response time? Is it, um, you know, raising legal issues that are um, that are hypothetically mm -hmm. um, risky versus practically risky. Um, so we see a lot of these surveys being done along with uh, employment satisfaction surveys. But again, helping legal departments and legal leaders put you know, lines in the sand to better understand how they're being perceived. And in turn, taking that knowledge and that data and uh, creating activities and actions that will only better those relationships with their internal clients. 
The one footnote on this, Bernadette, I think that's an excellent point. The one footnote on this, the best practice I heard from speaking with a client is, in order to first construct a survey, engage your business partners and ask them, what does good service look like? Mm -hmm. And then, how well do I perform against that? I think we sometimes do the second step and not the first step. And that first step is critical to get buy-in in the process and also identify what success looks like before you just go around and just measure it directly. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Mark. Um, on the fourth point, this is a conversation that I've been having often with corporate legal departments. In fact, I uh, just met with a large financial institution with their global leadership. And the topic that they wanted to talk about was the department of the future. Um, and a great deal of that conversation was focused on the millennials that are coming um, into, the, into the legal profession. Now, there are a lot of millennials right now in legal, in law firms, excuse me, and they'll eventually make their way into legal departments. Um, but what was interesting about this conversation was it wasn't necessarily concern about millennials coming into the legal department because one, one GC joked with me, he was like, they're, they're attorneys. There's a particular type of person, regardless if you're a millennial or a Gen, mm -hmm. Gen X or a baby boomer, uh, the law attracts a certain type of individual. Sure. But sure. the concern was not about the, the millennials as practitioners. It was, how do you work with the millennials as your business clients. Mm -hmm. um, I've written down here on this slide a, a, a few things, um, some stereotypes, if you will, about um, millennials versus non-millennials. And so some of the key uh, issues that we talked about were um, how millennials are, um, they want to always be at the table. They want to have a voice. They are um, they're uneasy with hierarchy. And if you look at traditional law firms, it's all about hierarchy, mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, you know, millennials really want flexible work environments, and uh, you know, being at the office, being at the desk is not as important. And again, that's a little different from what life may be in a law firm where FaceTime um, is important. The one thing I thought was very interesting was. Um, that they're transient. They're not very focused on, you know, the hierarchy and all of the climbing the ladder, uh, climbing the ladder, and focus on gra um, greater income. That's less of a priority to them um, versus kind of at the law firm, you know, becoming an associate, senior associate, making mm -hmm. a partner, and all of the financial incentives there. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, and it's it's probably pretty obvious with um, there's. Millennials love their technology, um, and lawyers, just as a general matter, um, appreciate technology, but probably have lower levels of tech adoption. Yep. What do you, th if you, what's your experience with millennials in uh, the legal profession, Mark? You, the millennials are coming. I feel like Paul Revere going <laughs> through Boston. Well, you know, I mean, I think th these are great points, and I think, like you said, they're. They're not dispositive, if you will, but they definitely you know, indicate certain trends and a movement in, in culture. And so I guess two thoughts come to mind. One is, and it's implicit here, is the growing expectation of transparency. Law departments, lawyers, tend to work in a black box. And, and sometimes that's actually really good practice. But if your millennial client wants to have a voice, they first need to stay informed. And that means your obligation to inform and bring them up to speed and be transparent, it grows. And, I, and I, I've seen that with my own employees on my own team. The other thing, and again, that's a theme that comes, cuts across a lot of this, is the lawyer as an executive, the lawyer as a, a business leader. If you're going to lead a business initiative, you're going to be leading some of these same people in cross-functional teams to accomplish a business priority. And so, you know, in your role to manage or in your role to lead, these are the kinds of folks that you need to kind of drive and, and get on board. And so the, this cultural shift becomes increasingly important as that lawyer works outside the law department and leads these teams towards um, broader initiatives. Yeah. And so I think these are excellent points. Yeah. Well, we're going to switch gears a little bit. And uh, we just finished focusing on staffing trends, some internal trends um, with personnel and staff within the legal department. And we're going to take a deeper dive into a particular new role and discipline that we see within corporate legal departments. And that's the rise of legal department operations professionals uh, within corporate legal departments. Um, you know, Mark, 
I was just recently at a um, at an ACC function mm -hmm. that focused entirely on corporate um, on legal department ops and corporate legal departments, and they were expecting a handful of these professionals to come, and surprisingly, they had more than a hundred department op professionals mm -hmm. at 10, and I think that was, when you're expecting 30 or 40 and then you get 100, I mean, this is definitely a trend that we're seeing. So let's take a look at what these legal department ops professionals are doing. So Mark, you've worked with a few um, LDOs. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of their responsibilities and roles? Well, I think, you know, what they're really trying to do more than anything is bring the business of law um, to the forefront. And I think, like you noted before, the role of technology in the delivery of legal service is growing. Um, and therefore, business professionals bringing um, the business of law kind of perspective and a more holistic view to the operations of the law department is, is really kind of their, their lens or their perspective. And so on a tactical level, they're focused on matter management. They're looking at budgeting and how they actually manage the, the billing of, to, to outside counsel. They do handle some administrative functions, but they do get deeper in billing guidelines and AFAs and all the stuff that uh, as lawyers and as law departments, we're just starting to kind of think about and drive as um, changes in the way that we operate. Yeah, I think it's all the things that we didn't learn in law school and that we really didn't perfect when we were in private practice at the law firm. So bringing a business person with this type of expertise and discipline is the absolute uh, right move. And we see, again, more departments hiring this role. Um, and it goes back to some of the time tracking stuff that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, what is a lawyer's highest and best use? And if we could take some of these things like vendor management, outside counsel mm -hmm. management, finance management, and have that f the focus of, um, of a professional and within the department, that'll just make the lawyers even that much leaner and faster and more responsive to those legal issues. Definitely, definitely. Um, one of the main things moving on um, that these LDOs will focus on is helping lawyers determine the staffing of matters. And it's not just staffing of where does this matter go to outside counsel and which outside counsel, but even that fundamental first question, which is, does this matter stay in-house or does it go to outside counsel? And one of the trends that we saw on the Thomson Reuters in-house efficiency survey is that, again, more work is staying in-house, and less work is going to outside counsel. And part of that is just workloads are increasing for in-house counsel. But again, nothing will beat the business relationships, the know-how about the business, the, uh, the business, the products, the industry that an in-house attorney brings that when you're outside counsel and have you know hundreds of clients, you just can't focus in on that in the way in an in-house counsel with one one client can. Mm -hmm. No, that makes tons of sense, and I think it also recognized kind of the inherent divide in the practice of law between that which is transactional and that which is litigation oriented. Yep. And to your earlier point around picking the right spots to bring external expertise and get an outside in perspective, and then really figuring out that staffing model internally with a focus on the, the generalist slash transactionalist work, because that's where that, that internal expertise really allows us to deliver, like you said, on the know-how of the business, the know-how of the products, the relationships with internal business partners. Uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at that Thomson Reuters in-house efficiency survey, because we take a deep dive into particular practice areas um, litigation, intellectual property, contracting, litigation, a few others. And not only do we look at what work stays in-house, what work goes to outside counsel, we take a look at specific tasks within each of those practice areas to see what type of tasks are being done by in-house counsel and then what that handoff looks like to outside counsel. And again, there's efficiencies in what stays in-house and not just, again, not at just at the matter level, but at the task level and the efficiencies and what that handoff might be to outside counsel to allow your outside counsel to hit the ground running once the matter is transferred to them. So definitely take a look at that part of the, um, the survey because it, it just doesn't, it focuses on this task base um, efficiencies that a lot of people aren't talking about. And I'm really interested about, I mean, I think there's a lot of really great foundational insights in that, and I'm really interested to see as we continue to survey as we go forward what we learn and how it evolves over time, because I think across time we're going we're gonna to be able to develop even greater insights. We're going to go on to our seventh tip in trend, and 
Uh, again, this is going to be in the LDO's wheelhouse, and it's the collection of analytics and metrics. And again, I go back to my joke, like no one went to law school because they enjoy <laughs> collecting analytics totally. and metrics and data. Yep. And that's why you have an LDO, a business professional, focused on this. Um, and it's just amazing to me to see the enormous amounts of data that corporate legal departments are collecting. I think in 16, we'll see more departments start to collect and create metrics programs. Um, but what's very interesting for those organizations and those departments that have um, sophisticated metrics programs already going, to see how they use that data and put action behind it. Yeah, I think that's spot on, and I think there's somewhat of a hierarchy, not to get um, too um, overcomplicated about it, but there's baseline metrics, there are then analytics, and there are predictive analytics. And how the metrics move to analytics even becomes how those metrics turn into, to your point, decision-making mm -hmm. insights. How do they allow me to make better um, or more efficient decisions or decisions around how to bring more efficiency? We don't need to get all the way down to predictive what will happen in the future, you know, what's litigation outcomes, to have those metrics turn into true analytics with decision-making insights. I think you know, even just knowing what's going on tactically will inform our decisions. And that's a really important thing for a lot of departments to focus on. Yeah, that's funny. I just did an interview with Matt Fawcett, um, who's the general counsel of NetApp, and his LDO, Connie Brennan. Uh, that's featured in Thomson Reuters Forum magazine. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Matt says. Matt says, you know, we collect a lot of data. That data becomes metrics. And then we choose those metrics that will help us make decisions. And those really become the analytics. And so you'll see um, a lot of legal departments just starting on collecting, collect, collecting the data. Mm -hmm. And then, again, fine-tuning and refining. So my best practice to, you, to all of you who are considering these programs is um, you know, identify the universe of, of data that you can collect, and then to better understand what will be meaning for you to you. And to go back to one of your earlier points, Mark, to understand what will be um, meaningful to your business partners mm -hmm. um, and to find ways to collect that data to show your value and contributions to them. Yep, I think that's exactly it. Um, so for this part one of 16 for 16, our last tip and trend is uh, that we'll look forward to in 16 is um, the procurement, implementation, and adoption of new technologies within the corporate legal department. And um, you know, I, I think what's funny about this is you'll have LDOs really focus on the procurement, and that is a big piece of um, of, techno of purchasing technology, actually procuring it, um, but that is just one step of one step of the battle and the road ahead. Because um, what departments I think can do a better job of is actually finding better ways to implement those technologies and to gain uh, wide adoption across. To really, you know, you're making an investment. You need to show a return on investment, but you have to use the technology. So, Mark, you work with a lot of departments. Any best practices on, on procurement, implementation, adoption of technology? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, one thought, and then um, I'll answer that question maybe directly. I think, as you're recognizing, Bernadette, I, a lot of departments really have three, I think, principal levers at their disposal. Technology, tools, and people. And technology is a principal one that, that they should be employing. And so I think um, this trend recognizes that this is a principal lever. And I think that the headline here on the slide says it all. It's the change management bit that is particularly um, challenging for a lot of departments. And to get back to an earlier discussion point, it's around their role as business leaders and leading people through change, leading their departments, and as, as you said, leading their business partners through change. The technology doesn't sit in a silo, it's in the service of um, their clients. And so they frequently are leading these technology initiatives to bring efficiency and effectiveness to the LD, but they're doing it in service of their clients, so, so they need to broadly consider the impact and the change on their business clients um, as they do that. And I think, you know, one way obviously is, you know, the what's in it for me. The, the, the mm -hmm. one thing that I think we all need to think about is when we bring technology into our work, what is exactly benefiting the consumer of that technology? Because the change, 
to disrupt an existing practice. And as a lawyer, a lot of times we get, you know, I used to get stuck into like the way I did stuff. You need to be very cognizant of that natural kind of momentum and how you can change behavior, leading with the benefits to that person first. And that, that's what we hear across the board through all a kind of technology adoption initiatives. How do I communicate this is good for you enough to change what I am doing? Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. So when I was at that, uh, speaking to, the, to this financial institution, I asked around the room, so what are the, what is, what's been the technology that has changed your practice the most? And um, there were probably attorneys there, probably in our peer group, that said, you know, the BlackBerry, the internet. Mm -hmm. And then their, uh, one of their more senior attorneys says, I remember when there was triple carbon paper, he was like, that was a game changer for us. <laughs> so talk about change management for that particular attorney in mm -hmm. his practice. Mm -hmm. so, um, so again, really focusing on technology and focusing on how it's a, it's a win and bringing efficiency uh, over your department. You have to make sure that you're promoting those wins and uh, encouraging adoption. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, in this first part of uh, 16416, again, we covered building stronger internal legal teams. We looked at um, a particular new role within a corporate legal department, the legal department operations professional, and talked about some of their roles and responsibilities to, uh, related to um, staffing, technology, um, analytics, and metrics collection. Um, next time we meet, uh, we're going to turn the page and uh, talk about uh, some of the regulatory uh, and compliance issues that are facing corporate legal departments and some of the best practices we see on that front. And then finally, we'll end with um, certain soft skill development that we see um, new to in-house attorneys developing. And while I say it's going to be for new to in-house, I think they're just universal skills regardless of mm -hmm. your tenure within a legal department. So it'll be a nice refresher for um, all corporate counsel. So thanks very much for joining me and look forward to our next conversation uh, as we continue our discussion about uh, these top tips under 16 for 16. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.